Hi class, welcome to another lecture in soil mechanics. So this video is under chapter 4, permeability and seepage. So in the previous video, we discussed uh, permeability from the definitions until the permeability of stratified soils. So in this video, we will now discuss the seepage force through the design of filters. So first, let, let us define seepage force. So these are the soil particles. So in, in between this, Soil particles are voids in which water can flow. And as the water flows through a soil sample, um, the soil particles offers some resistance to the force of the flowing water and the force applied by the flowing water to the soil particles is what we call the seepage force. So another term that we have to define is the quicksand condition. So this is the flotation of particles of cohesionless soil, so such as fine gravel and sand, due to vertical upward seepage flow. So um, this condition occurs when the seepage pressure, which acts in the upward direction, overcomes the downward direction pressure due to the submerged weight of soil and the sand grains are forced apart. So the result is that the soil has no capability to support a load. So in this image, a man is sinking down the quicksand because the um, soil in the in quicksand condition has no capability to support the load of the man or the weight of the man. So another thing to remember is that quicksand condition is not a type of soil but it is a flow condition rather that occurs in cohesionless soils. So let's proceed to the Laplace equation. So Laplace is a mathematician. So he is well known for his transform equations. But in this subject, in geotechnical engineering, we will apply his equation through simple flow. So for this setup, H is given by this equation when Z is in the first layer of soil. So this layer. And for the second layer, so this, this second equation is applicable for calculating H in which um, we have K as the hydraulic conductivity and the capital H as the um, thickness of the soil sample. So, let's try to solve this problem. So, for the given setup, 
we have H sub 1 as 305 mm and H sub 2 is 508 mm. H1 is 610 mm. H is 508. Z is equal to 203 mm and the hydraulic conductivity of the first sample is 0 0.066 cm per second and the diameter of the soil specimen is 76 mm. And we are asked to determine the flow rate of water through the two-layered soil. So, for this solution, first let us check whether Z falls in the first or second layer. So, Z is equal to 203 mm and that is less than H1 so therefore the first equation is applicable So, H is equal to H sub 1 times 1 minus K sub 2 times Z all over K1 H2 plus K2 H1. So, this, we can directly substitute the values. So, okay. So, but we have to um, mind the um, the you have to mind the um, units so this is equal to 610 mm times 1 1 minus k sub 2 times 203 mm all over 0 0.0066 mm per second times 508 mm plus T sub 2 times 305 mm and substituting H we have 508 and we can get T sub 2 as 0 0.03 uh, 0 0.0369 mm per second or 0 0.0369 
centimeters per second. So, in this problem, we are asked to find the rate of flow. But the soil sample has two layers. Therefore, before we can use the equation Q is equal to K I A, you, we have to get the K equivalent because, again, the soil is in two layers. So, the K equivalent is equal to H1 plus H2 all over H1 over K1 plus H2 all over K2. And substituting the values, we can get 0 0.0442 centimeters per second. And then, now that we have the equivalent hydraulic conductivity, so we can compute Q is equal to 0 0.0442 cm per second times um, 610 or the delta H Or let's use the um, centimeters, 61, 61.0 centimeters all over 30.5 times 50.8. So why 30.5 plus 50.8? Because this is the total length in which the water flows. And then, we have to multiply the area. And it is stated in the problem that the diameter of the Soil specimen is 76 mm, therefore this is pi over 4 times 7.6 cm squared. And we can get 1.5049 centimeter, cubic centimeters all over <clears throat> so the rate of flow through the two, two layered soil is equal to 1.5049 cubic centimeter per second so this is um, determined using the Laplace equation So let's proceed to flow nets. Imagine that this is a sheet pile and we have the upstream side and the downstream side and then And then the line here is an equipotential line. So what is an equip equipotential line? So this is the line along which the potential head at all 
points is equal. Meaning, if you would put um, piezometers in this line, the water will rise above um, to the same level. So, the first one is in here and the second piezometer is here. So, no, the water level of the both piezometers will be the same. And next is we have the flow line. This is a line along which a water particle will travel from the upstream to the downstream side in the permeable soil medium. And then, suppose that we have finished um, growing all the equipotential and um, flow lines, you will form a mesh somewhat like this. So, the combination of the um, equipotential and flow lines is what we call the flow nets. So, flow nets are used in the calculation of groundwater flow and the evaluation of heads in the media. So, the space between the flow lines or, okay, so the space along the flow lines is what we call the flow channel. So, we have some boundary conditions when we are constructing flow nets. So, first, the upstream and the downstream surfaces, so that is line A, B, and D, A, are equipotential lines. So, meaning, if we will put some um, piezometers at points lying in line A, B, the piezometer level will rise or the piezometer levels will be the same. So, second, because A, B, and D, A are equipotential lines, all the flow lines intersect them at right angles. So, this is another important note in um, constructing flow lines. So, the flow, li uh, flow nets rather, the flow lines should be perpendicular to this equipotential lines. Yeah. So, third, the boundary of the impervious layer, so that is line FG, is a flow line, and so is the surface of the imper impervious shape pile ACD. So that is a flow line. And again, the equipotential lines intersect ACD and FG at right angles. So this, based on the first, uh, I mean, Based on the second boundary condition, these are right angles. And based on the last one, these are right angles. So, this is the graphical method of flow net construction. So, the graphical method is the method in which the flow net is constructed by an intensive trial and error procedure. So you can draw this manually or by the use of 
drafting software such as AutoCAD. And it is the simple, simplest and quickest method of flow net construction. So, since the method includes trial and error proceedings, um, a lot of practice is required for achieving accurate results. So, first let's um, go through the steps involved in the graphical method of flow net construction. So, first of all, smooth curves representing the flow lines that meet the specified requirements are first marked. Then, the equipotential lines are drawn such that they cut or intersect the flow lines at right angles. So, it must be ensured that the equipotential lines are drawn such that the fields form approximate curvilinear squares. So, the third is any defect that may be present must be identified and duly rectified. So, and lastly, the flow nets will be finally satisfactory for practical uses when the fields are curvilinear squares. So, let's go back. So, these are, this is what is referred to as curvilinear squares because the equipotential lines and the flow lines will intersect at right angles. So, that is what you will form. So, there are also some key points that must be considered. So, the first is the boundary conditions must be duly established. And second, it must be ensured that each flow line cut the equipotential lines at right angles to each other. And lastly, the space enclosed by the adjacent equipotential lines and flow lines must be curvilinear squares. So, now that we know how to um, create a flow net, so, let's now proceed to the determination of the quantity of seepage by the use of flow nets. So, as I have discussed earlier, the strip between any two adjacent flow lines is what you call a flow channel. And second, the drop in the piezometric level between any two adjacent equipotential lines is called the potential drop. So, so, this one. So, we have the piezometer here. And suppose that the next equipotential line is this one. So, if you will put um, a piezometer, you will, you will get a drop. So, kung ano yung level ng piezometer dito, hindi na siya magiging equal sa level ng piezometer dito. Mas mababa yung makukuha natin. And the difference between those two is what we call the potential drop. So, the total rate of flow through all the channels or Q is given by K, H, and F over N, D. Wherein K is the hydraulic conductivity H is the head difference between the upstream and downstream sides. And NF is the number of flow channels. And ND is the number of potential drops. So let's have an example problem. So a flow net 
for flow around a single row of shift, fi uh, shift files in a permeable layer is shown. So we are given that Kx, Kz, and K are the hydraulic conductivity in different directions is equal to 5 times 10 raised to negative 3 centimeters per second. So first, how high above the ground surface will the water rise if piezometers are placed at points A, B, C, and D? So, let's solve. So, first, let us determine the head difference. So, H is equal to um, 5 minus 1.5. 67. So this is equal to 3.33 meters. And then um, let us determine how many drops are there. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So, this one. Drop. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. The first drop, the second drop, third drop, fourth drop, five, fifth drop, and sixth drop. So, at this point, uh, this line here, the ground surface in the upstream side, the piezometric level will be 5 meters. So in this equipotential line, it will drop to a certain level and then so on until in this um, layer or this level rather, this one, the piezometric level will be just one point. 67 and another thing to remember is that the drop between these two is constant or equal so if knowing that we can compute the drop 3.33 all over 6 drops is equal to 0 0.555 meters. So, now that we have the drop, um, we can compute the um, piezometric levels for points A, B, C, and D. So, for point A, we can get 5 minus 1 drop only. So, 5 minus 0 point, um, 5, 5, 5. So, this is equal to 4.445 meters. Um... For B, for the drop at B, um, so we have two drops. So this will be 5 minus 2 times 0 0.555. And this will be equal to 3.89 meters. For letter C, 5 minus um, 5 because this is the fifth. 5 times 0 0.555 
that is equal to 2.225 meters. And lastly, for D, this is equal to at D, drop at C. Because um, points C and D, points C and D lies on the same equipotential line. Therefore, their piezometric um, levels will be just the same. So, let's proceed to part B of the problem. So, what is the rate of seepage through flow channel 2 per unit length? Okay. So, Q, uh, the equation Q, K is equal to N, times n f uh, sorry h over n f over n d is the total but we are only asked to determine the flow at flow channel 2. So, therefore, part, uh, definitely not the total. Ano? Okay, so, if that is the case, um, let's denote um, the flow Q. So, delta Q is equal to K H all over N D. Notice that NF is omitted. Why? Because NF refers to the number of flow channels. And if, because the flow in these different channels is equal. And if you will multiply them to the number of flow channels, you will get the total. But in this case, only the flow in channel 2. So, no need to multiply to the total number of flow channels. Because the flow in only one channel is required. So, substitute K is equal to 5 times 10 raised to negative 3 cm per second. And then for H, the head difference is 3.33 or 333. So 333.33. centimeters all over the number of drops which is 6 so delta Q or the flow at the second channel is equal to um, 0 0.277 7 5 cubic centimeter per second per centimeter width. 